first of all, I wanted to say thank each and every one of you all for being here today and taking out of your busy schedules to be a part of this conversation. Um, we're this is basically an opportunity specifically to talk about the you know this idea of what are some of the challenges that are facing not just local communities, but then also utility providers and services that are happening in our communities across this country and the intersection of those things. And talk about what are those, how are we addressing these new challenges as it relates to COVID-19 and the crisis um, that we face in today's term, in today's time. So I want to thank the National League of Cities. Uh, I'm Timothy Evans. I actually work with the National League of Cities. I am the membership engagement manager for the Northeast Mid-Atlantic region. Um, we want to thank HomeServe and the Service Line Warranty Program specifically for helping us to put this on and really leading this conversation in this space. And then on top of that, we want to thank all of our panelists that are going to be on this phone call today. I, I want to say one thing because I'm actually here to speak here. I, I had this opportunity. What we are, what we're trying to embark upon in this conversation is really a conversation about ecosystems and understanding the impact of utilities and COVID-19 and how that relates, not just within the space of you paying your water bill, but understanding the dynamic and broader space of infrastructure and its whole, its overall impact, not just at the state level, but the local level. Um, and even among private sectors and how municipalities are, are tackling those, those dynamics. And so that's what you can expect from today's call as we go through uh, the conversation today. Now, we have a phenomenal and a lot of people who are going to be speaking today. And that's what I, I want to make sure that you get it, you glean in as much of this information as possible. So let me give you, let's go through a couple of housekeeping uh, things. One, your microphones. If you can make sure that you place your uh, phone, your microphone on uh, mute, um, that would be great. When you get in, you'll, it'll already mute, it'll self mute it, but just in case, just make sure you do that. On top of that, we're going to take questions because we have so many dynamic individuals who are here to speak today. We want to make sure that like, we're going to take questions at the end. So start flooding your questions over to Tim, uh, Tim Reed, and he'll kind of take those in and we'll, he'll send those out uh, later on. Now, I do want to say there's two ways to be able to ask your questions. The first one, is that you'll notice that there is an option to raise your hand. If you raise your hand um, toward the end, after we get to when we get to the question and answer, I'll just call on you. Um, that's one way. But then on top of that, if you enter your question into the Q and A feature, what what will happen is that, as I mentioned before, uh, Jamie and Tim will be responsible for kind of taking those questions in, and then we'll answer those accordingly. Now, finally, if you miss everything that we say today, if you're not able to take enough notes. I want you to go on ahead and just remember that there's a recording. This is being recorded. And so in the next couple of days, this will be distributed out uh, for you all to be able to share that information. Now, before we get started, the last thing I do want to say is that I, we have to acknowledge where we are as a nation. Um, recently, over the last couple of weeks, we've had a uh, series of protests, uprisings, um, and unrest in a lot of our communities. And I think that is something that we do need to acknowledge as it, stand, as it stands to COVID-19 and how that really impacts a lot of our communities. But more importantly, I think the key thing for us is that we also need to stay focused on the needs of municipalities as it relates to um, the budgetary crisis that we're facing. And that's kind of what this conversation is gonna be focused in on. It's like, how do we make sure that municipalities are leveraging all the resources that they can at this present moment? to make sure that they can meet the demand of the budgetary issues and crisis that they're facing in their communities on top of dealing with um, a number of the challenges as it relates to unrest and protests that are happening across this nation. And so without further ado, I wanna kind of dive right in specifically to like our first conversation that we're gonna be having. So I wanna introduce uh, Mike uh, Armstrong, who is the general manager for Water One, a utility service provider. And one of the key things that I think was really insightful to kind of just learn about him as a, as a, as the general manager, executive officer, you know, he's responsible for a lot of the utility operations, personnel and fi financial affairs. And, but not only that, I think what was great is that he's, he's grown up through the water one uh, community being the general manager, serving as general counsel and director for legal, legal and auditing uh, since, since 1998. 
And I think that's really important to understand for us moving forward. And so, uh, Michael, I wanted to kind of first ask you this question as you kind of bring this into this, as you kick off this conversation. Can you talk to us about, you know, the challenges that you are facing um, or talk about the importance of keeping water running, right, and during this period of time and some of the challenges that you might be facing even with just maintaining service during COVID-19? Definitely. Thanks, Tim. Well, you know, Water One is the essential business. And uh, Water One, we have a 24-7 operation, and we consider providing safe, reliable water supply to our community to be critical. And we know we're responsible for protecting the public health and serving the public. So especially in a situation like this where there's a pandemic <clears throat> and people are being told that they need to wash their hands multiple times a day, we're a key part of that uh, public health element. So I feel like our staff is extremely committed to that mission and we know that our customers are relying on us um, to continue providing water service through that, um, those challenging times. So I'm extremely proud at how well Water One has responded to this situation. I think one of the questions that you threw out there was, uh, what service components did we prioritize? And we really did, never did cut back on any of our services. I'm proud to say that we continued serving our customers really without skipping a beat. We have a great staff, great leadership, um, and we have very supportive customers. We also have a great uh, elected board. And to me, the biggest challenge in this crisis has been the unknown aspect of the virus and also the frequency that the information and the guidance had changed. And I had a um, town hall meeting with some of our employees last week, and it made me thinking about um, a quote from Donald Rumsfeld, who was one of the former secretaries of defense. And after 9-11, he was in a press conference um, and he was briefing the, the press and they had asked him about um, something that hadn't happened. And he talked about things that we know and we don't know. And so he had that famous quote where he talked about that um, there are known knowns. There's things that we clearly know. There's also known unknowns. That's to say that there's some things that we don't know. But he also talked about things that are unknown unknowns. The things that we don't know, we don't know. And I think his quote really sums up this situation. Uh, the unknown unknowns are the risks that come from these kind of situations that are so unexpected that we really couldn't consider, you know, what was going to happen. And so what we try to do at Water One is have an all hazards emergency operations plan and we keep it updated quarterly. Uh, we do uh, tabletop drills twice a year. So we had a section in our uh, emergency operations plan that addressed flu that we had developed uh, back in 2008 with the bird flu or the H1N1 flu. And so we started relying on that section in our emergency operations plan. So that was kind of how we started looking at this situation, but this crisis has made it clear really that every emergency is different. And so, you know, when we got together, I got my group together um, around March 12th. We got together just to say, okay, where are we on this thing? Because there had been conflicting stories about how bad is it going to be? Is it going to reach the Midwest? And so we got together and determined that it was really something that was serious and that was going to probably cause a big problem. So we started updating our plan and implementing things early. And I think that that really helped us get ahead of the game a little bit. I think Water One was probably a week or two ahead of a lot of utilities, a lot of cities. So I think that that really helped us. We didn't wait until there was a stay at home order in place before we started taking action. And I think the fact that we were proactive really sent a message to our employees that we were taking it seriously um, and that we were able to stay focused on maintaining our services. So um, I think that's really, you know, as far as meeting the challenge, that's really the way we looked at it. Uh, we decided to send as many people as we could home early on. We have about 400 employees and we sent about a third of our workforce home to let them work remotely. 
um, so that we could make it safe for the folks that were here at the treatment plant and working in the field. And um, so that's kind of how we approached it. And technology has been a big part of that. I can't imagine where we would be um, 10 years ago with this situation. I mean, having the ability to work remotely and having so many of our staff have laptops has really been phenomenal. And I wanna give um, a shout out to our IT department uh, because they have done a great job of preparing us for this kind of thing, having people set up with uh, laptops to, to work remotely and being able to deploy new technology quickly. So we were able to kind of address this situation without really skipping a beat. So um, we've been really fortunate. I feel like we've been blessed as an organization. We have not had any of our employees um, come down with the virus and um, you know we've been preaching all the CDC requirements of you know social distancing and staying home if you're sick and that sort of thing and so yep. um, we feel like we're really uh, lucky that way and um, so that's kind of how we've been addressing the challenge. Awesome thank you so let's we're gonna we're gonna keep moving because I, I do want to come back to you Mike if you if we can but I, I'm gonna come back to you towards the end. Okay. Um, all right, so now we have the executive director for the League of Oregon Cities, Mike Cully. Um, as I mentioned before, one of the key things, uh, he's the executive director for the League. On top of that, I think one thing that's really important to note is that he represents uh, one of 49 state league executives or state league municipal leagues across the country that represent municipalities and residents from across this country within their given state. And so I wanted just to turn it over to Michael, uh, to, to Mike Cully to kind of share with us, you know, can you tell us like, what are you hearing uh, from your members in Oregon as far as the challenges that they're facing around this area? Because you, you, you folks at a state level, and I'm gonna actually challenge you a little bit differently too. Can you talk to, even just as you talk to your peers across the country, it, you know, what, what are you hearing from there as far as the challenges that they're facing as it relates to COVID-19? Sure, yeah, thanks for the opportunity, Tim, I appreciate it. So I am one of uh, 49 state leaders and we're a collaborative bunch. So uh, we share best practices, we get together and I can tell you that uh, the word unprecedented uh, in terms of this crisis has been used uh, almost too often. This has really been a period of time of adaptation, change, pivoting, and especially leadership. Uh, we had been obviously untried in this area uh, and have uh, been put in a different position as a leader in our state. So as a League of Oregon Cities, uh, we represent all 241 cities here in the state. And we work, Tim, not only on the, on the local level with municipal governments, obviously, but also the state level and the federal level. So it's a coordination of efforts uh, using all members of our team to really connect with everybody, uh, all these different stakeholders to get things done. And you know, I'll start, I think, at the state level, at the local level, rather, and tell you that uh, not all cities have uh, everything uh, in common in terms of issues. There, there are differences across each one of these cities, and you have to be sensitive to that. Some of the things that we've done as a state league in terms of reaching out and touching our members uh, that have really caught fire and really been a good uh, piece and tool for us to use to connect is a statewide conference call that we conduct every week with all of our members. And we're getting about uh, anywhere from four to 500 participants on that call a week, um, not only from the local level and municipalities, but from the state uh, and the federal level as well. So we're bringing all these resources together. We've used a conference call because not everybody has availability or access to high speed broadband to run these things. But that is a touch point uh, that we're able to bring all the communities together and really hear uh, the differences and there are some uh, there's some very big differences not only locally um, here in Oregon but across the country so everybody is is facing a different piece of this crisis in a different way and communication has been the key uh, cities have been looking for a touch point a point of leadership and that's where the leagues have stepped up and working with the National League of Cities again we share best practices we're able to get together uh, once a week and learn from each other about what's working. And at the end of the day, um, it is really about working on all three levels. So we need to assure that there are federal funds coming to the state level and we need to assure that the state level is getting federal funds to the cities to keep things functioning. And that's 
that's not always easy. So the CARES Act dollars, the, uh, the, the coronavirus relief funds that are coming to the state need to get to the cities and need to be there for different reasons. Uh, so our relationship at the state level is just as important as it is with our grassroots members uh, in the cities. So we work very closely with the governor. Uh, I myself am involved in the Coronavirus Economic Recovery Task Force that we're looking at all these things. We even partner with the, the private sector, especially municipalities, when we talk about keeping the lights on and keeping the water on. We're working with uh, companies individually to make sure that folks aren't shut off or disconnected. And these are, these are great partnerships to have, but also different partnerships than we've ever had in the past. So when you talk about testing uh, the limits of what an organization is about, I think leagues have really taken a, a hard pivot and really taken a leadership role in their states to really figure out how to best connect with cities, how to connect the cities with states, and again, how to leverage what we're getting uh, from the federal level to make things work. So, Tim? Yeah, thank you for that. I think the key thing, and I really appreciate you mentioning this, this idea of leadership. Um, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dovetail that into the next conversation with Mayor Vince Williams, but I want to make sure that, that that's one of the seamless things that are mentioning. You know, there's the unknown, unknown, right? But despite not knowing what's coming down the pathway that uh, Michael Armstrong was talking about, there's still leadership. And that's kind of the key thing that's happening. And I, that's great to hear. And I, we've talked to, we, yeah, it's great. It's great to hear the things that you guys are doing. Um, all right. I don't know what you just said, but I did hear my name. So I don't know what you said, but hello to everyone. I don't know what Timothy has just instructed me to address because you kept going out on me. <laughs> hey, hey, Mary Williams. How you doing? Can you doing. give it to me? And what, what is it? What, what's going on? Yeah, no, no. I think the, the key thing here that I'm, I'm, I'm actually going to really pivot towards you is this idea of understanding the role of like, what are cities facing in this space? Cities, towns, and villages, and communities, uh, as it relates to really thinking about how they we even address COVID-19. How are they leveraging each other? I mean, as second vice president of the National League of Cities, I know you're on a number of phone calls and re, you know, you're learning more about what municipalities are need. So can you speak to some of those things as well? Right. I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to do the best I can, Tim. We're having some, uh, I don't know if it's internet connection issues, but anyway, certainly thank you for allowing me to have this opportunity to speak. You know, one of, one of the things that I try to share uh, anywhere I get an opportunity to speak is that this is not just a big city issue. This is an every city issue. And, you know, when you look at what the federal government has uh really started to propose, and that is certainly the CARES Act. You know, they've identified a criteria of, of uh, 36 cities uh, that meet the 500,000 population threshold. That is totally, uh, I, I applaud them for that. However, all America is primarily made up of small cities, certainly under the uh, 500,000 population. One of the things that many of us are hit with are our small businesses. So there are a number of small businesses that will not be able to recover if we don't get some federal funds in to assist them. You know, and that's going to be one of the big key efforts that we do in our cities to address bringing on or, or rolling, uh, getting the economy rolling again. Because if we don't help these, uh, these businesses that have been certainly instrumental in uh, keeping our economy going, you know, it is going to be a real travesty to us all. You know, municipal budgets certainly are, are hanging by a thread, as we know. You know, certainly um, many of us are in the midst of, uh, uh, of uh, couching our new budgets, but also we are very fearful for, uh, as, as it relates to that because they're, we've, we're already missing some very key revenue streams that we uh, depend on. And certainly uh, over these past few months, you know, I know I have seen uh, in, just in my city alone uh, a 23 to 25% shortfall in uh, some of those revenues as it relates to sales taxes and different things like that. But certainly what it takes is being able to uh, stand in the face of this adversity. 
because this is this is where the rubber meets the road as it relates to being a leader and we must remember that we've got to work together you know look at those best practices that other cities are utilizing but also if you find the best practice make sure you share it with your your neighbor or uh, your one of your colleagues from around the country but certainly national league of cities has been the voice and the leader in this space and uh, i i'm very thankful that we've had the opportunity to uh deliver the message of, of, of cities are essential around this nation and we're beginning to get momentum from that when you look at 88 percent of cities expecting a revenue shortfall that's something very critical when you think about that i'm not talking about the 36 cities that have gotten some relief you know, it is gonna take all of us to be able to get this country back on, on, on point. Thank you, Mayor Williams. I think the, the one thing I, I do wanna just follow up real quickly on is in your mind, can you speak to any like examples or ideas that you have gleaned uh, for ways that other municipalities can be able to learn more? Or is there any like, councils or is there anything within NLC that can be a resource to them specifically? Well, I would have to say if um, uh, if you're a member and even if you're not a member, reach out to someone who is so that you can get the valuable information that's certainly plastered everywhere on the website. You know, reach out to all of, um, uh, make sure you're, you're connected to, with, with Irma Esparza Diggs, you know, uh, the director of all federal relations. Make sure that you're speaking to those people who can carry the message for you and find out how you can be a help to make sure that we carry this city's our essential messaging, you know, but making sure that you stay connected. You know, there's a newsletter that goes out, but you know, do like I, I keep the website up 24 seven to make sure I'm not missing anything. You know, so you gotta make sure that you're plugged in. You know, people are depending on you uh, as a leader to uh, pull them out of this, you know. So certainly, I know that's a lot of weight to carry, but hey, that's what, that's what we do. We bench press. So let's get out there and do it. Thank you very much for that, Mayor Williams. I think, you know, one of the key things that I, was, I really appreciate you mentioning was the impact to small businesses within your conversation as well. And so I'm actually going to dovetail to uh, Mayor Weir from Independence, Missouri, because I think that one of the key things for her, you know, I would love for her to kind of share some of the conversations and some of the thought processes around how to leverage public-private partnerships potentially in that space. Um, and more importantly, I'll just give, I'll give a little brief uh, introduction real quick. But ideally, uh, so the mayor, she's in her second term in the city of Independence, Missouri. Actually, I drove through there um, when I used to live in Minnesota. Uh, so anyway, so on top of that, um, she is the city's 50th mayor and the second female mayor. Um, but I'll just kind of throw those things out and mayor, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks. It's been great hearing all of the comments so far and the insights and the great resources everybody has to share. Um, so Independence is the city, sec second largest city in Jackson County. We're right next to Kansas City, uh, immediate neighbors. I mean, I live one mile from Arrowhead Stadium and the Kauffman Stadium where the Royals play. So we're in this big metropolitan area. Um, that's sort of anchored by Kansas City and goes across the state line to where Michael is over in Lenexa, Kansas, and this big metropolitan area that spans two states, just to give you kind of the context of what we're talking about. Because I'm really going to, you know, I'm really approaching this more from a regional standpoint. Certainly, you know, in the city of Independence, as Mayor Williams said, we're experiencing those revenue short shortfalls. There's not one city in the state of Missouri that is, has a population of 500,000 people. There's not one city, I don't believe, in the state of Kansas that has a population of 500,000. So, you know, we're working really hard um, on that avenue. I will say, well, I, by same manager put this very well, and I have repeated it often, COVID didn't cause us to lose revenue, it just accelerated the revenue that we were already losing um, and, and a, in a major way. Um, but I think partnerships are really important all the time, regional partnerships, public-private partnerships. 
and especially during this time. And we've really relied heavily on our business community and those private sector partners to help to guide us in closing and reopening. We, you know, as we sat down with our area mayors and county executives and county commissioners and started to really design these reopening plans, you know, we, we really came to, you know, said, you know what, we should need to kind of back off. These businesses know better how to handle these things than we could ever tell them. And our regional chamber of commerce um, and our civic council and our MPO came together, really put together a phenomenal plan for businesses, um, not mandated, not enforce, you know, enforced um, requirements about how they had to tackle that, but just some best practices. So businesses, large and small, could, you know, have kind of some sort of a guidebook. And I think that's been really very, very helpful. Um, we are, um, I think very fortunate in our region. I sit on a um, steering committee for an initiative called Casey Rising, which was started several years ago, which is our regional plan for prosperity. Of course, with this happening, the impact to operations, certainly the economic impact, um, has really caused that effort to pivot um, necessarily. But also, I think. Um, that's a real opportunity for leadership. But what we've realized with Casey Rising very early in this crisis is that Kansas City ranked, the Kansas City metro area, um, really ranked very high um, in terms of attitude about resilience and optimism. That they, you know, there was a higher level of um, feeling that we were going to rebound financially and operationally better than some peer metropolitan areas. So I think that sort of kept people's spirits high, and that's a message that we've been trying to promote. We have, um, there's an effort in the metro um, that's called Comeback KC. It's really focused on testing and tracing and accelerating that. We are way behind where we know we need to be in terms of how many tests we're doing per day and getting those results out to people so that we can get to where we can see the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, and that has really been spearheaded by the business community and coming together with the elected um, officials in the region and saying, and the public health departments and saying, how can we assist in getting this testing and tracing accelerated so that we can get to the recovery phase um, and potentially the vaccine and potentially cure phase sooner. Uh, so that's been something that we've worked very closely on through um, our Mid-America Regional Council, Council, which is our metropolitan planning organization you know, um, Michael had talked about their emergency pandemic plan. Our region has a emergency pandemic plan that we've worked on for decades, um, and now we get to put it to action. And that was a little more difficult than we anticipated because this wasn't the type of catastrophe that we expected. Being in the Midwest, we expect tornadoes. I mean, we expect, I mean, sadly, terrorism attacks. I mean, we did not expect the crisis to be this. And so it was a little bit, we were very well prepared, but not prepared in the same mindset that we potentially expected. Um, since we're talking a lot about utilities, I mean, certainly utility assistance and, and working across jurisdictions and across the public-private sectors is really, really important. Um, all of our CARES money is coming to the county and then the county is distributing it to the cities. We've asked for $9 million in utility assistance just for the city of Independence. We operate our electric, our water, and our sanitary sewer, and our delinquency is running about two and a half to $3 million per month. We, of course, 
you know, are not doing utility shutoffs. We are not doing late fees. We are not charging for you to pay by credit card um, because we know that those are essential to the health and safety of our community during this time. But that's a significant financial impact, which then we have a 9.08% pilot. So it's not only impacting our utility funds, but you know, significantly impacting our general fund. Some of our neighboring utilities um, have determined that they will start doing shutoff, um, will resume shutoffs. We're not gonna do that for a little bit while. Our plan is to not start that until August because we don't wanna do it. I said earlier, it's 90 degrees here <laughs> today. We're not gonna be shutting you off anyway because of the hot weather rule. Um, but that's something that we are continuing to say in every conversation with, you know, with the White House, with Congress, with a, our county executives, with our regional leaders. You know, utility assistance is going to have to be a significant part of this recovery plan, and that's going to require more than just what the cities are and municipal utilities are going to be able to handle. Um, specifically in our city, some partnerships that we have established other than just, you know, working closely with our business community, working closely with our Chamber of Commerce, we have used some of our additional CDBG money that we received to do a small business, a, you know, a small, small business loan program. We think it's very important to continue to help these small businesses with the recovery. So obviously the city isn't going to start doing credit analysis and and lending, but we are partnering with some organizations in the region to help us to process um, those small business loans using our CDBG money. Um, you know, our um, infrastructure, just in general, very early on, we established what we are calling our futures initiative to say, how is our life going to be different and how do we want it to be different? At the, on the other side of this. How are, what lessons can we learn from this experience about how people want to interact with our city? And um, we've had some very exciting conversations about transportation and um, utility delivery and you know, how we can use some of those things. I mean, a lot about renewable energy and, and park systems and all of those things about how is this going to, you know, for a very long time, alter the way people behave in a city and how they um, interact in their communities? So we've spent a considerable amount of time working okay. on that as well. I mean, I'm amazed to hear about 88% of cities predict a revenue shortfall, and I'd really yeah. like to meet those 12% <laughs> 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 who aren't. <That's> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you're right. Thank you very much, Mayor. Um, I think one of the key things that comes to my mind when you were sharing is one, you talked about this idea of the regional collaboration. I think that's really, really important to how we address COVID-19 uh, because of the fact that COVID-19 does not stay within the municipal bounds or the county bounds. And so I think the other thing that's, that's really important around this is community voice. And how are municipalities leveraging their spaces to be able to really get glean from the communities? What are the impacts? What are the things that are critical to, that they're learning? <coughs> I'm going to dovetail this now to uh, Deputy Mayor Schaefer, Steve Schaefer, to kind of share like, what are some of the key things that you guys are gleaning from this period of time as far as public forums that I'm going to do a twofold. I want to, I want to hear from you. Uh, what are some of the social restrictions? Um, have you, have you been, how have you been able to adapt to some of the social restrictions, stay at home orders, potentially that you all are under? And then the other question I wanna ask for you is, what have you learned or what have you started now during this period of time that you're, you have determined that you're going to continue afterward? Well, thanks, Timothy. I appreciate uh, the opportunity. Uh, I could spend all afternoon talking about everything that could be done differently. And uh, previously, a previous mayor, I believe, talked about their emergency plan. And it's funny how, not funny, but how 
emergency plans, really, we didn't have one for this, this pandemic. And this presented a whole set of new issues that we had to adapt. And I think flexibility is the key thing in terms of uh, local government, because the federal government, state government can make orders and decrees and mandates, but local government is ones that has to be next to the people carrying out the services. So um, it, it's been quite a challenge, but it's been a lot of fun too, in terms of learning more about the community and our citizens that we serve. Uh, Evansville, Indiana is the third largest city in, in the state of Indiana. We're in Southwest Indiana. We border uh, Southwest Indiana, borders Illinois and Kentucky. So we have a regional uh, feel in terms of how we do business in this area. And this MSA is about 350, um, 350,000. So um, our city is about a little over 120,000. And um, the resources that we've been able to pull from within our city, our county, and regionally has been amazing. In terms of public spaces, that's a great question. Uh, in terms of our public meetings, we immediately made plans with our convention center to move into uh, their space simply to have more social distancing. So we were having our, all of our city, county, public meetings take place in a bigger facility. Of course, the mic would be wiped down. Uh, it, it would be available on the internet, on TV and so forth in terms of public access and to be able to comment. I think Zoom and WebEx is the new, um, I wish I would have bought stock in those tools because they become the, the new norm in terms of meetings. And I think that's gonna continue. Uh, in Evansville, we are planning our, our city county buildings. Our employees have returned last week, and but they've had restrictions coming in. It's taking the temperature, uh, masks in the building. Uh, and then June 15th is when the public is, is back in the building. So. Those restrictions will still be in place, but we've also done things throughout the building in terms of putting uh, plexiglass uh, sneeze guards, the plastic uh, in the council chambers in between the council members, uh, and also leaving rows of seats so that there is enough social distancing in between so that we're adhering to those guidelines that our medical professionals have given us. So public meetings will certainly have a different feel when the public is back in person in the building but I think we've made the, the accommodations and hand sanitizing stations throughout the building, uh, signage, just trying to make everybody as aware as possible so that we can make them feel as comfortable as possible when they're here and when they're interacting. Uh, our city, during the pandemic, Mayor Winicky created, um, uh, he wanted a task force solely focused on reopening. And that's what the reopen Evansville task forces, which I lead. There's key areas of focus, whether it be business assistance, government operations, quality of, of life, food security, or workplace safety and testing. There are a tremendous amount of volunteers uh, under each of those areas, but we're fortunate to have all of the task force um, under the um, advisement of a medical advisory group, which is made up of uh, medical professionals from our local hospitals. So it's a, it's a huge effort and a lot has happened in a short amount of time. And I think the culture of social distancing, hygiene, all of these things are gonna continue. And I think it's, it's, a, good, it, it's, it's a good thing in some respects. So Timothy, I don't know if, if you have questions for me, I can go in all day about all the challenges that we're having right now. But. Uh, well, how about this, on a different call? <laughs> you don't want to hear my problems <laughs> you, you, I, I, I will say this I think I think at the end of the day um, to your point uh, there are a number of things that our municipalities are facing and Steve I think f for you all in Evansville what's great to hear is that how you all are being you all are leveraging this space to be able to think critically about how you should be rethinking your, your, uh, how you do meetings, how you interact with the public. But then I think one of the key things is how do you make sure that you are creating a space that's welcoming, uh, that is inviting and really, gl uh, really glean that information uh, from your residents, business owners, so on and so forth. And so I think that's kind of the key thing. And I appreciate you for kind of mentioning some of those key things. And for other municipalities that are listening on the call, um, please make sure you take some of those those nuggets um, and look to see whether your <coughs> municipality can tackle them. 
So I want to kind of dovetail to our last speaker of, of this period, and then we're going to shoot into questions. If you can, if you notice at the bottom of your screen, there is a Q&A box. Go on ahead and begin to fill in your questions. I think we already have one from Patricia DeMarco, so we'll make sure we ask hers first uh, after this. But I want to go on ahead and turn it over to Doug. So Doug is the owner of Lazos Plumbing. Uh, and one of the key things that I think was, is really important in this conversation is that, you know, sometimes we speak at such a high level of all these different policies, but we need to also be able to clear to understand what are some of the local challenges that business owners are, are facing. And so I know Mayor Vince William and Mayor Weir mentioned this as well. And so I actually want to turn it specifically over to you, um, Doug, to really speak to like, how are some of the key things, like how are you serving your customers during this period of time? What challenges are you facing during COVID-19? And what are some things that maybe local elected officials and other members can really glean from your experience to make better policy decisions <clears throat> moving forward? Thank you, Timothy, for, uh, for giving me this opportunity. And um, I would like to congratulate or applaud our mayors that are out there. Uh, because I know they're facing some real challenges. However, the COVID-19 um, situation was a shocker for us in a sense where the dynamics of our company and our day-to-day -day operation was just completely halted. And being the owner, uh, and I have no partners, it's uh, been a family-run business for over 60 years. I have my son here with me now, but it was like, okay, what do we do? We have 38 families that we are responsible for that work for us and they're you know, families, children. Some of the guys, their children work for us. I have a whole family, you know, a father and his two kids work here. So yes, it was quite the undertaking and you know, making preparations to keep our employees safe, uh, face masks, face shields, um, sanitizing trucks, sanitizing equipment, um, hand sanitizer. I mean, as everyone knows, and you know, the shortages of all those things in the beginning, um, we searched high and low. We've used every resource we could to try and get everything uh, to keep our staff safe. Uh, then we had some people in our office uh, work from home. Again, as, as a lot of people said, you know, the technology that we have today is very fortunate. Uh, unfortunately, we had to use it under these conditions. But uh, then our next challenge was now we need to go into people's homes every day. We are an essential business. Uh, we have residents calling up with no use of sewer, um, water main breaks. You know, we do a lot of this type of work. We are basically utility contractors along with internal plumbing and drain. But um, you know, we had a, a regular questionnaire that we would ask people before we can go into their home. We would have to ask them, you know, was anyone sick in your home? Was anyone subjected to the COVID? Is anyone under quarantine? So we had this whole question and answer period with the customers. And some people were, you know, a little upset. Some people understood. Uh, some people didn't want to hear about it. They just knew that they had a problem and they wanted us in their home. Uh, but we needed to take the, you know, precautionary measures. Uh, as far as the guys working outside, we had signs made uh, requesting people to keep their distance from our employees working outside. And we would put them on their front lawns on each side by the sidewalks because everybody likes to look to see what the contractors are doing, not realizing, you know, the situation and you know, guys may be hopping out of a machine or doing something, they're gonna be right standing right next to them. We also did that with you know, working in someone's basement, making a repair on a sewer line. At the bottom of their stairs, we posted a sign, please keep your distance to keep everyone aware because you forget, and especially if someone is working in your home, you wanna go down, you wanna see what they're doing. It's your home, you wanna see, are they doing the right job? Are they keeping it clean? Or they, you know, whatever the case may be. But under these circumstances, we needed to keep the homeowners safe, and we also needed to keep our employees safe. So those dynamics, you know, and it'll never be the same as far as I'm concerned. You know, you're always going to go into someone's home. You know, we had a couple of people 
you know, that they went into homes and they see up, we found out that someone was uh, subjected to someone else. So then our, we sent our staff home for a couple of weeks, put them in quarantine. So they came back. Thank God no one in our company um, wound up with the COVID, but we needed to take those precautionary measures. They're driving in the truck with some, you know, a, a helper or another mechanic. They drive around with their masks on. We're sanitizing the trucks. I mean, it's, it's just something that we never anticipated. And, you know, we look back at it now, now it's now, and, and, you know, we're, we're here in the United States. I mean, we adapt to things and, but now it's like, okay, you have your mask on, you clean your truck. Everybody walks around with gloves on all day long. Now it's like old habit, shall we say, but, and that's going to be the new norm, you know, and I, I'm convinced of that. And, you know, like Mike, um, Mike Armstrong had said earlier, you know, it's the fear of the unknowns. In the beginning, when this first happened, our employees were like, well, what if we go to someone's house and we do this? What if we go to uh, this supermarket? Because we maintain a lot of supermarket chains. And, you know, the supermarkets are filled with people. They're essential. So now we're walking into a supermarket that has 100 people in it, employees, customers, and they have issues there. And we need to keep that store up and running because it's an essential thing for people to get their food and supplies. So it's, it was a rough situation across the board. Uh, but knock on wood, we made it through. Um, there were some slow periods. We had a couple of weeks where things were a little bit tough there, you know, trying to keep guys busy. We didn't lay anyone off. We, you know, one day we had, you know, 20 guys cleaning trucks. We had the cleanest trucks in, in New Jersey here. <laughs> but uh, we needed to do what we needed to do to keep everybody working and, and keep everybody safe. But as far as moving forward, and again, I congratulate all the mayors and these municipalities. I mean, I'm much smaller scale and I know what I dealt with. Uh, fortunate for the municipalities, they have a lot of people that can help them. You know, for me, it was, uh, you know, I'm leading the parade. But uh, we made it through and, and we're going to keep going. We've been in business for over 60 years and hopefully another 60 more. Yeah. So. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doug. I, I just want to emphasize a couple things with what you said. I, I think the first thing to mention is that for everybody that's on this call right now, if you have not already connected with your local business uh, owners about the challenges that they're facing, um, who might be, as Doug said, you know, it's only it's a small man, it's a small group of people, it's, you know, it's a one man show or a small company that really is surviving off of the, the services. They may be an essential service. It may be a non-essential service. But the point is, is this, if you're not having those conversations, you need to do that. We need to take as much advantage of that as possible to be able to make sure that we are accessing our, um, you know, the people who are helping to really push our economy forward. So that's the first thing. The second thing I think is really in, insightful in, in this case is understanding also how things are Unfortunately, they're changing and understanding how businesses are having to either push the change for communities, but also giving it to a space to understand how city leaders should be also helping to facilitate that change in the most smooth, the smoothest way possible. And so I think those are some of the key things that I would just mention. And thank you very much, Doug, for really joining this call. Um, I, we only have about nine minutes left, so I'm going to go through a couple questions that I know Patricia has asked. And then from there, I actually do have some other questions that I was going to ask as well, if there are no other uh, questions. And then people can feel free to chime in. I'll give you a, ch a chance to kind of say any last minute thoughts or ideas or strategies for other municipalities. Um, so the first question is, uh, due to the funding methods, communities will face revenue reductions well into next year. For example, the liquid fuels fund that comes from the distribution of fuel tax, I see very little in the congressional approach to, for small boroughs and cities, uh, real small businesses, 100 people or less, um, who are badly affected by the aid um, that's available so far. So what can we do in order to drive assistance down to the local level? And I'll, I'm gonna throw that first to Mayor Williams uh, because he has that Cities Are Essential logo in the back, which is great.
he wasn't expecting to be called on. <laughs> hey, you know what, Mike? If you, if you can, well, here he is. Here, okay, here you go. Here he is. Here we go. Sorry about that, uh, Tim. Yeah, I had something else going on here while I was trying to stay focused here. So you want me to speak to what? Come on, come on. Uh, let me hear you again. I'm sorry. No, it is basically how how can how can municipalities or how can communities work to be able to get the resources that they need from the federal level down to the local level. So what strategies or what things can they do? Well, one one of the things that uh, I'm doing and we're doing uh, not only in 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 my city and my state, but across this nation, we're we're doing aggressive letter writing campaigns to all of our federal leaders. Uh, we need to make sure that they understand and they hear from all of us because we see our neighbors um, in the grocery stores, in the dry cleaners. You know, we see them, at, 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 you know, in the communities, whereas these federal leaders, they only see them when it's time to uh, time to go and vote. You know, when they need their support, they call the mayors, the council members, you know, hey, can I depend on you? Can I depend on your district? Can I depend? depend on your city. So those are things you need to do. Make sure you're reaching out to them and let them hear the personal stories that are taking place. You know, because one of the things that I'm very concerned about when we speak about uh, this, this space of uh, small business, uh, you know, if we as cities are not getting what we need, think about what's going on with our small business. So hopefully, you know, uh, and I feel very optimistic that we will get the support we need from the federal government. What we're going to do is make sure that we carve out some of that money for our small businesses that are having a real hard time of it, you know, because uh, in my city, a number of my businesses haven't received any uh, federal funding at all. Mm. You know, I mean, there have been some that have gotten the PPP, <laughs> but uh, many of them have not been able to um, qualify, if you will, for the small business assistance. So those are the things that we need to make sure that we're looking out for those men and women who, if we don't help them, you know, their businesses collapse. And as uh, Doug just shared, you know, they're responsible for other families as well. You know, so they need us and we need them. So certainly we've got to make sure that those letters, those calls to our federal leaders are uh, certainly pushed out but also make sure your business community understands that and get them on a letter writing ca campaign as well, because they are also voters. Thank you. Does anybody else want to answer that before we transition? Sorry, you're on mute, Mike. Now I'm not, right? I just want to chime in. Mayor Williams is so articulate about that. And that sign behind him says so much. I mean, we're facing a crisis on two fronts, not only health and a public health crisis, but the economic crisis is staggering. And I can tell you that cities are lagging indicators of what's happening uh, in the economy. Right now their budgets are fine, but it's reality. They're facing a 20 to 25% reduction in revenues across the board, across the nation. And that's, that's choices mayors don't wanna have to make. Public safety, essential services, what gets cut, what doesn't. So it's essential as his, uh, as his background says there, that we get funding from the federal government and the, the, the National League of Cities right now is working really hard in conjunction with all the state leagues to push a $500 billion package in two increments of 250 billion. And that has to be, that has to be put out there to, uh, in the economy, to our small businesses because they are the backbones of our city. So I'll just stop there. So I definitely wanna chime in real quick, I think, I really appreciate you uh, hitting on that that key point, Mike Kelly, and then on top of that, Mayor Williams as well. Um, I think that the National League of Cities has really put in. We've left everything. We've put. We're putting everything on the field. There will be nothing left of us after this, but we will still continue to move forward. And so, yes, I agree with everything that you said. Um, you know, as we get ready to close up, we have about three minutes left, and I wanted to give each of you the opportunity to say, not a brief remark, but give me, give us like one word that describes your thoughts about how the future of, how do you feel about this next phase or this, this phase of our future moving forward as it relates to COVID-19? One word, let's see if we can get this done in three minutes.
Tim, why don't uh, we have, uh, we'll go in order. We'll have uh, Mr. Armstrong give us his one word. Optimistic. All right, Mr. Cully. I'm hopeful. Ms. Weir. Resilient. Mr. Schaefer. Uh, resilient. Mr. Williams. Very positive. <laughs> Last but not least, Mr. Lanzo. I would say very positive too. That's good. And I think we just hit some very positive things. We, end, we actually did that in less than one minute. <laughs> that is <laughs> impressive. <laughs> so I wanna say, first of all, thank each and every one of you all for being a part of this panel today. Um, as the key, as we mentioned before at the beginning of this call, this is really an opportunity to kind of get a sense from a broader standpoint of like the ecosystem, understanding the challenges and how not just um, at the state level, at the local level, but across the spectrum, how you all are uh, delving and addressing COVID-19 in your communities from utility provider, but also to local governments and businesses as well. And so with that being the case, I want to say thank you to everyone. Thank you to HomeServe. Um, and the NLC Service Line Warranty Program for helping us to put this on. And if you have any questions or any information, you need any information, covid19.nlc.org is one of our key websites for resources. On top of that, you can just go to nlc.org to learn more. But thank you all very much and have a great day.